Well, greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome to AMC Mailbag, the mailbag show here on AMC Movie News, where all we do is take your mailbag questions, talk about the things that you want us to talk about. My name is John Campy. I'm the editor-in-chief of AMC Movie News. And joining me, as he did yesterday for this installment of Mailbag, is the one, the only, Mr. John Schnapp. Hey, what's going on, everybody? Glad to be here. Sunday's mailbag. Woo! And we've got a bunch of mailbag questions. Hey, I'm going to let you guys know, if you've got a topic or a question you want us to address, either on AMC Mailbag or sometimes on AMC Movie Talk, just email us at this address. It's at, at AMC, not at, sorry, just amcmovietalk at gmail.com. Email in your questions, and we draw from those questions that come in for AMC Mailbag and, of course, for our daily AMC Movie Talk show as well. And we're going to just jump right into it today. Lots of stuff to cover today. We got six questions in the mailbag, and we're going to get started with this first question. The first question today comes to us from Jasmine Jackson, or is it Jace Mine? Jace Mine or Jasmine? I don't know. Uh, Jackson, who writes... Hey there, sons and daughters of AMC. Love the show. Thank you so much. The only place I go to for my movie news. I would like to ask something along the lines about AMC rather than films. Okay, well, on AMC move, on AMC Mailbag, we get a little more relaxed here. We're a little bit more behind the scenes, so sure, whatever. They go on to write, We fans are very vocal about our opinions and concerns when it comes to the movies we watch, especially uh, within the geek community. And I was wondering if you all ever thought of bringing in a fan to talk with you all on your live broadcasts. Um, so basically the question that's being asked here is, and this is something, oddly enough, we have been asked many times in the past, is uh, ideas and suggestions have been floated to me before about the idea of, hey, once a week or a couple times a week, you guys should you know, like have contests and have let, let a fan you know, uh, a viewer sit in on the show as well and sit at the table. And I'm, like I said, I'm taking this because I don't mind going into behind the scenes questions when we do mailbag. Kind of give you guys an inside look about how we run things at AMC Movie News. I have always said and probably will always say no to that. And number one, I love fan involvement in the show and that's why we do mailbag to just take the topics you guys want to address and you send them in. And all kind of stuff. But actually having like as a guest panelist on Movie Talk, random fans, I'm probably always going to say no to that. And the reason being is because I think everybody wants to be on the show, but nobody wants to see other people on the show. So like, look, I was coming back to ESPN a lot. I'm a big sports fan. A lot, I watch a lot of ESPN, right? And I love watching their football panel on NFL Sundays, or I like watching their basketball coverage, or I like watching, you know, whatever. And whether it's Mike and Mike in the morning or uh, all the shows ESPN do, right? But I watch because I like those guys and I tune in to watch those guys. And then when they bring in experts to talk to about football or about basketball, or whatever, they bring in experts and panels. And, and that's what we try to do on AMC Movie Talk is once in a while we bring in guests who are experts on film, you know, who, who are big in our community, who have loads of experience in film journalism and, and the film world and things like that. And we try to bring those people in because we think on, on large, our viewers want to see those people and hear their input. Um, so we like to do that. But what you'll never see on ESPN on Sunday football is have an extra chair right next to Keyshawn Johnson um, for we're going to bring in one of the viewers to sit in and talk football today, too. Because although it would be a lot of fun for that viewer, I personally wouldn't want to watch that dude. I want to hear Keyshawn Johnson talking about football. I want to hear Boomer Esiason talking about football. I want to see Mike Dicka talking about football. I don't care to watch an average football fan that they grabbed and pulled. I'm talking about me as a viewer. As a viewer, I don't care to watch an average fan that they plucked and put on the show to talk about football. And that's just my perspective as a fan, right? So my impression is a lot of people would like the opportunity to do something like that because it sounds like a lot of fun, but I don't think as a whole the audience wants to see that. So no, that's probably not something we're going to do at any, at any particular time. It's... Uh, but we love getting fan involvement and viewer involvement. And that's why we do things like AMC Versus, where we leave it up to the fans to vote on the results. We do things like AMC Top 5 that the fans vote on. We do AMC Mailbag, which is all the stuff coming in from you guys that you guys set in. But to actually set up a panel, I, I just don't think it's something that the, the majority of the viewers of the shows 
are interested in seeing. Right. I, I don't know. Am I way off base? Is this something we should consider? No. Or like, what do you think? Well, I don't think so. I think you hit the nail on the head when it's like every everybody who wants to be on you know a show. A lot of actors would like would like to be an you know on the TV show that they watch, or would like to participate in a right. show that's like that, or. Uh, with talk shows, it's the same thing. Like, hey, I'm into the same subjects. I think I could add something to it. But what you said is true. It's like, you know, that that fan is not necessarily like what other people want to watch. Other people are tuning in to AMC Movie Talk to hear what you have to say, what Amy Rose or Dennis or I or Christian or Alicia. All of our different perspectives and opinions all come from us doing things in the world of media and having certain uh, expertise and knowledge about certain things. So that means our opinion has, over the course of time, added some kind of value to it so that people might like it. Some people might hate my perspective or like my perspective, but it's mine, just the same as yours. So it's a great way. Sometimes we'll talk about a movie. You might love a movie. I might hate a movie. I might love a movie. You might hate a movie. So it's like, and it's good because we are coming at it from a really certain perspective, you know, our, all of our perspectives are our own opinions, but that doesn't mean any of the things that you liked about a movie that I hated. That means that you're wrong. It just means that no, I like them because these certain you know these things I liked about it. So I don't know. I mean, I guess what I'm trying to say is like sometimes I'll get a, a, a you know some fans will be like, hey, I'd love to you know how's it, how do I get a show like this or how do I how can I ever become part of the show? I'd love to come on as a guest, and it's sort of one of those things where it's like, well, I mean. I always, you know, I don't respond to a lot of these questions because I, I kind of feel like, you know, you should kind of, you know, we've said this a lot of times on the show. It's like you should start your own show. YouTube yeah. is free. We're, we're talking like right on like a little webcam here that's really affordable. You can get it for like 50 bucks. There's a better webcam. But like, you know, there's different base models which you can get. Everyone has, you know, if you're online, you're online. You can just connect with Skype, do your own show, record it, put it up on YouTube. That's free. You can just do it in your in your in your own apartment. Right, right next to your computer, locked down, bam, talk about whatever you want, start letting your friends know, start you know advertising it, get a following, get people who are into what you're talking about, build your own audience. It's sort of one of those things where you kind of, in a certain sense, have to kind of be a self-promoter and a self-doer, you know, be really positive about what you're, don't ask us for like the fan handout is what I would call it. Like, hey, I've got a good, I've got an opinion too. It's like, Everyone has an opinion. I'd love to hear your opinion if you want to put it on YouTube and enough people are like, hey, you know, if somebody was like, Schnepp, you got to watch this dude, man. He's, he's really funny or uh, uh, this amazing lady is like her opinion is incredible. She's so smart. I would watch it. I'm sure if I heard about it, then I would find that person. So. I, and I've got um, I, I've done a lot of stuff about trying to uh, guide people and, and give people mm. help some people and, and how to do what kind of what we do. But if, if you're somebody who wants to do the kind of stuff that we do, I wrote an article a long time ago, but I, I've reposted it a few times because I believe it's still absolutely relevant. Just search on Google. It'll My article will be the first thing that comes up. Search on Google for 20 tips to starting your own movie blog or 20 tips to starting a movie blog. Uh, I really encourage you to do that where I, I put as much as I can into that about how to get started and how to, to build up things and how to get good at what you're doing uh, and finding your own voice and things like that. So once again, hop on Google and search for 20 tips to starting a movie blog or starting your own movie blog. And my post should be the first thing that comes up. And I wrote it like five or six years ago, but I, I reread it again uh, for somebody like maybe a month ago, and all the points in are still completely up to date. They're still completely right valid. Um, so I would really highly recommend doing that and jumping on there and doing that. So, But, you know, getting back to the thing that you were saying about, you know, people who are used to AMC Movie Talk, they're, they're interested in coming and watching the crew that they're used to, right? Like, even somebody like Gray Drake, and Gray Drake is five degrees of awesome. Yeah, she's but Gray is just amazing. incredible. We <laughs> love Gray. But Gray is somebody who's senior film critic at Movies.com for a long time, right. senior film critic at Fandango, right. and now she's the senior editor at Rotten Tomatoes. Yeah. She is as legit in this business as anybody, and I love having her. But even then, sometimes when we have her on the show, I get inevitably a lot of the comments and a lot of the emails we get is, you know, hey, I didn't, I didn't tune in to watch her. If you're, I'm sorry, if you're interested in movies, you want to hear <laughs> yeah. from Gray Drake. But yeah. but even then, something like Gray Drake, it's like you know, we're not really interested in, in her because this is kind of the what we're comfortable with is the crew that is normally on this show, and you know, we get some really high high quality guests in 
from time to time, like from Silas Lesnick um, to oh guys, all all the guests, various guests that we've had at different at different times come in, and and a lot of people appreciate the these experts that we bring in, and and sometimes. You know they're not so happy that this is not what they're used to, and I just don't think on on whole. I'm spent. I'm sorry. We're spending more time on this topic than we should, but um, I just don't think in the majority of our viewers would be interesting in seeing us add another person to the panel that they don't know, they've never heard of, they've never read their stuff. They're they're not you know working in the film industry. I just don't know that there's. There's a desire for that, to be honest. Yeah, so. I mean, if anything, I, mean, I think it's great that we have people who enjoy watching the show. I mean, I came on as a I'm guest. I'm still amazed by that. Yeah, I came on as a guest like <laughs> a little over almost two years ago, and they and John was like, hey, we loved having you as a guest. At that time, I was just directing Metalocalypse and trying a bunch of different projects. I was just making a bunch of different things and came on, uh, had you know some knowledge about the Marvel characters from Guardians of the Galaxy. They had just announced it, and... Uh, I just kept coming back. They said, hey, you want to come back? I was like, I love talking about movies. I'd love to come back. And I just kept coming back. And then it just became a thing where I was like, they were like, they started paying you for it. Yeah, they started paying me for it. I was like, hey, you know what? This is pretty fun, yo. So (laughs) that can be you. That can happen to you. I mean, I'm just saying it's like, and that's, I've been working in the professional business for 15 years as an animation director, editor, a director, a producer. So, uh, I'm just saying, like, if you really want to be on a show, like, I think being a, you can do your own show about AMC Movie Talk and talk about the things that we've talked about and be like, Dennis Zing was wrong about, you know, or something. (laughs) You could do that. That could actually be fun. I might watch that show. Not about Dennis. Don't rip on Dennis. But, um, yeah, I mean, there's all these possibilities. We live in the world of YouTube, which is a great space. There's also Vimeo. There's a whole bunch of different applications where you can have your show be seen by millions of people. Yeah, I mean, if you want to talk about movies... Lots of it has never been easier to start talking about movies. And who cares if five people watch you, if ten people watch you, if if a thousand people watch you? If you love talking movies, get a webcam, sign up on YouTube, and boom, you're you're good to go. But yeah. anyway, it's time for us to get to actual some movie questions here. So we will now move on to question number two. <laughs> and question number two today comes to us from Brian Bruner, who writes, "Hello, AMC. I've noticed that people don't seem to enjoy the DC movies quite as much." Personally, I love the Dark Knight trilogy and the Man of Steel. Their movies are a lot more darker and serious, while Marvel has a little too much comedy. I just wanted to know why do you think people enjoy Marvel movies more than DC? Um, well, Brian, I, I I don't know that you're correct. Uh, number one, I mean, let's not just write off the Dark Knight trilogy. The right. Dark Knight trilogy is beloved. Yeah. It, I mean, the dark, now everybody knows I've got some issues with the Dark Knight Rises. Everybody knows that Schnepp's got issues with the Dark Knight Rises. That's fine. But the the Batman Begins and the Dark Knight are so awesome that still as a trilogy, it's amazing. Yeah, it's a great take on the Dark on the Dark Knight on the Batman character. It's an amazing, refreshing, excellent uh, take that Christopher Nolan carried through from one, two, and three. So yeah. it's like I'm glad that he finished the trilogy. I think it's. I loved Christian Bale in the first two movies. I loved Heath Ledger as the Joker. It's. It was really one of those kinds of uh, uh, the kismet. Yeah. Like I can't and believe it's this beloved. happened. Yeah. So like, don't undersell how much people love the Dark Knight trilogy. It's beloved. And as far as like Man of Steel, like I've said this several <coughs> times, like Man of Steel to me, there were four major comic book movies that came out last year. And to me, head and shoulders above them all was Man of Steel. Man of Steel was the best comic book movie last year. And it still holds up. You know, it's on HBO right now. And I was like, I don't own the actual Blu-ray yet. But I was right. like, oh, it's on HBO. I'm gonna, so I watched Man of Steel. And it's, I mean, I've seen it like five times. And I was like, oh, I'm just going to watch it again. I watched Terminator two nights ago. The, an, another incredible film. But Man of Steel really holds up as a great film. I think personally, I know a lot of people had a lot of beefs with like the darkness of it and wasn't as comic booky as they wanted. And it had a lot of, you know, emotional aspects like Superman killing Zod and things like that, that they didn't think the character would do. You know, I mean, I'm not shrugging that off. like, uh, But, you know, for me, that perspective and that take on the Superman, I think it really worked in our time that we live in. And as for the character, he's got to li- live and learn in this in this new world. So. Yeah. Um, the, but the point what, that you're making is that, that Marvel and DC, like people are always bagging on DC. It's like DC has not had the output that Marvel has. Marvel sold their properties off 
to Fox. They sold their properties off to Sony. Yeah. Sony has Spider-Man. They're launching into a Spider-Man movie every year. They're doing Sinister Six. They're doing this. They're doing that. You have Fox. They have Fantastic Four. They have X-Men. We're getting Wolverine. a Spider-Man movie. this Just this year, we're getting Spider-Man, Captain America, um, what else? Uh, uh, X-Men, X-Men Days, of Future Past. Days of Future Past, and one more, Guardians of the Galaxy. That's four yep. Marvel movies. And what are we getting from DC? Zero. Yeah. Nothing. What about next year from DC? Nothing. And next year from Marvel, at least four to five more movies because not only is Marvel putting out two to three of their own movies through the Disney Marvel brand, but Marvel Fox. Marvel Fox, Marvel Sony, those people are also going to be putting out at least two to three movies of their own. So... Uh, DC, they had Green Lantern flop story wise. I mean, it just was not, you know, just didn't wasn't happening. It's kind of a bad film. Unfortunately, I have to say that. But in my opinion, and uh, Superman Returns was like the, they were trying to reboot Superman for 17 years. And that's what they delivered. You know, me and John differ a little bit. I, I really didn't. I fell asleep in the theater. He liked it. But, you know, I'm not saying it's a horrible film. It just wasn't what I wanted from Superman. So cut to that was 2006. Six years later, they released Man of Steel. Yeah, That's and then whole, you had the Dark Knight trilogy in, right in the middle. In yeah, there. and let's not forget too. Let's not over romanticize Marvel here. Marvel has put out a couple of films that on 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 mass people have not liked. Yeah, um, I, I did. I thought uh, Electra you know, at Oof. first. Uh, I would, no, that was a Fox thing. Okay, we were talking yeah, about that Marvel. Was Electra. Okay. But you're talking about just Marvel Studios, right? I mean, you look at Iron Man 2. Iron Man 2 is not a good film. I, See, I, I don't I, think... I think when I came out of it the first time I saw it, I was like, hey, that was enjoyable, but I think more and more that I watch it, I like it less and less. I, I liked Iron Man 3, but there are a lot of people that have real issues with Iron Man 3. So let's not over-romanticize it either that... Everybody just loves everything. Well, yeah. I'm Hulk. Happy. I didn't like Ang Lee's Hulk, but I liked Iron Man too. So, yeah, Ang Lee. I mean, well, Ang Lee's Hulk wasn't a Marvel film. That actually wasn't Marvel. They, Marvel Studios didn't exist yet when. Uh, okay, when well, Ang Lee's but Hulk. it's a Marvel character, I guess. Like but a Marvel character, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, but if we're talking about Marvel Studios. Well, I'm not talking about Marvel Studios because Sony and Fox aren't part of Marvel. Studios. Yeah, but I'm just saying if if we're talking about Marvel oh, Studios, right. the, as opposed to Warner Brothers sure, Studios. Sure. Then you know they've had some some trips. Look, I I like the Edward Norton Hulk, but many people did not. I really like the first Captain America, but there's a lot of people who found the first Captain America a little bit boring. Huh. That they didn't wow. really like it. And I I really did. Yeah. So let's just keep in mind. Schnepp saying Marvel's put out so many films that they've had the opportunity to have a lot of really good ones. DC has been more apprehensive about putting out their films. Or just slower, more hesitant in a weird way where yeah. I think if they knew how many fans they really had, they wouldn't have been so hesitant. Because it's like I remember every time it was like something was announced and then they were like, eh, eh, not this year. All yeah, the fans, yeah. including me, were like, what is wrong with you? Get a Grow a spine and yeah. say we're making this movie. I agree. I mean, it's like you have these properties that millions of people love. Get behind it. Stop being wivery. You know, it's like, just do it. I mean, I don't know. I know it's easy. And for, do it right. Yeah, do it right. I mean, it's <laughs> easy to right. say, do it right and spend the $100 million the right way. It's and like they're it's trying. A, yeah, they're I mean, trying. I think they are trying. And it's it's great to see the efforts moving forward. I'm 100% behind the, uh, the Batman vs. Superman slash Justice League. I know it's not confirmed, but the dual shooting. I think go for it. Let Snyder rock it. I think he did a great job with Man of Steel. I think he's it, Batman versus Superman is in good hands, and I think Justice League is in good hands. So that's better for us as far as if we want to see DC characters. Given the you know, I mean, that's where you're going to get into fights with like a lot of different like some people love the way the Man of Steel approached Superman, and some people really did not. So if they really did not, they might not like the new approach to the Frank Miller version of Batman. It's hard to say, but I'm all for it. You know. All right, all right. Let's move on to the third question today, and the third question today. Comes to us from Ben Zepp. And Ben Zepp writes, I was wondering why Marvel did not shoot and release Ant-Man before Age of Ultron and see part of Ant-Man as a tool to show the more traditional, well-known origin of Ultron that Hank Pym creates. Thank you very much for your time. Well, I, Ben, the first thing we need to address here is that part of your question where you say to show the more traditional and well-known <laughs> origin of Ultron that, you know, for those of you who don't know, uh, Hank Pym creates Ultron. Right. 
Nobody knows that. Nobody knows who Hank Pym is, and nobody even has ever heard of Ant Man. No, nobody, like, nobody's heard of Ant Man. Nobody outside of the of the traditional comic things. No one's heard of Ant Man, let alone the fact that he created Ultron. Nobody had heard of Ultron, right? Um, before this, I mean, they, yes, they would think that's something you pour into your car for faster <laughs> oil relief. <laughs> Use Ultron nine thousand. Yes, is that, the, is that the stuff <laughs> they put in the cars in <laughs> Fast and Furious? I mean, they, remember, like, even though us. And our circle of nerdy, sweaty friends, mm-hmm. we know who he is. I, I keep having to hark on this, though. We represent the 1%. Yeah. We are the 1% of people. So trust me, when I call my mom up and say, hey, mom, does it... Uh, I can call my mom and say, hey, mom, you looking forward to Avengers? Yes. You looking forward to Batman? Do, do you want to see a Joker in a Batman? She can say yes. I say, you looking forward to the next Lord of the Rings? I say to her, hey, mom, d- did you know that Hank Pym creates Ultron? And she'll say, the who's does the what's up? <laughs> you know, and my mom represents, you know, the vast majority of film goers. So the more well known, gotta take that out of the equation. It is not well known. Uh, just amongst us one percent, but really the average film fan doesn't care and they don't know. <laughs> so since the average film fan doesn't care and doesn't know, then it's just, is it important for them to say Ultron was created by Hank Pym? No. I mean, I know my comic book friends get their backs all up when I say that. How can you say that? Because it's true. It's not important. If, the, if 99% of the people have never even heard of that, then it is not important to them. And so then what becomes the question is, what serves the story best that Marvel is trying to tell? Right. And if, if the story that serves their ongoing um, narrative isn't that Hank Pym creates Ultron. It's actually if, through a weird twist, Tony Stark creates our Ultron inadvertently, then that's the way they should go. And that's probably what you see happening here. So why didn't they do an Ant-Man before Age of Ultron? Because they didn't need Ant-Man to create Ultron. They already had a great story idea, at least in their minds. Right. You know, Joss Whedon and Kevin Feige think they've got a great story idea. And that story idea does not involve Hank Pym creating Ant-Man. And if you've got a great story idea and it doesn't need that other character, then you don't do it. And then you introduce Ant-Man later. So I'm totally fine. Like, would I have been stoked if they said, hey, we're going to do an Ant-Man in in January of 2015. And then we're going to go into Age of Ultron later in 2015 where, where, you know, Pym creates Ultron. Yeah, I'd be totally happy with that. But once again, the 99% would, I, I don't know, who cares? Plus, they're going to have to be like, who's Ant- what if Ant-Man was a giant failure? Yeah. yeah, so, yeah, so, yeah. so you're putting all this weight on this character, Hank Pym, who A, has not been introduced into the Marvel Universe. You're, you're foregoing the amazing box office of Iron Man 1, 2, and 3, and him being in the Avengers. Yeah. Uh, you know, you're making a sequel to the Avengers, which has those other core characters, Thor, Captain America, Iron Man, and the Hulk in them. So it's sort of like Hank Pym's not part of that universe yet. You're not just going to chuck him in and make him a main character and introduce Ultron and take away from the screen time of these other four giant characters who already have their own Captain America 2, Thor 2, you got yeah. Captain America 3, Thor 3, maybe the Hulk, hopefully. So... And Iron Man 3. I mean, I'm just saying it's like it doesn't make any sense uh, in the cinematic world. So that people get bent out of shape about the Hank Pym thing. Sometimes it makes me laugh a little bit because I'm like, come on. We just had an Avengers movie. (laughs) They got all four of these characters in their own individual films. And then they brought him into the Avengers. And you actually got to see Thor fight the Hulk. Get away from me if you're angry about like Hank Pym not creating Ultron. You're crazy. Go read a comic book. So basically, That's what I'd say. To answer the question, why did they not do an Ant-Man film first to have him create Ultron? Two reasons. Number one, because they knew they didn't need to. It, it, it's, ultimately, it's not important. Mm-hmm. And number two, because they already had another great idea for bringing in Ultron that we don't know about yet. Right. And, but in Joss Whedon and Kevin Feige's mind, they have a great idea to do it, which didn't require Ant-Man. So that, well, that's basically the answer. Let me to add that. to that, too, because you said that it was, like, it was a, a great idea that... Ha- that Hank Pym is is important in the comic books. Absolutely, he's, he's yes, not, yes. He's absolutely. not important in the cinematic universe, but that does not make him a non-important character in the comics. And I think sometimes fans get that's what get they get bent out of shape is they feel that Hank Pym is being disrespected. Yeah, and it's like yeah. he's not. He's actually completely respected in the canon of comic book land. Comic books are not movies. 
you got to just They're remember two that. two different worlds. Different beasts, yeah. Yep. And a lot of times you're right. People forget that, that the comic books are not the movies, are not the comic books. Right. They, you know, they, they draw on them. They're influenced by them. They get their inspiration from them, but they are still two totally different things. And then one is not beholden to the other. No. All right, let's move on to the third question. Uh, sorry about that. The fourth question today. And the fourth question today comes to us from Jordan Currett. And Jordan Currett writes... Hey everyone at AMC Movie Talk. Just wanted to say that you guys rock first off. Well, thank you so much, Jordan. I'm a huge fan of the show and I've been watching uh, I, I've I've been watching since the beginning of the year. So my question is, what do you guys think of the new movie coming out, The Hundred Foot Journey? I love cooking movies, and this one looks really awesome. Just wondering, thanks for the great show and keep bringing on the filthy. Um I finally saw the trailer for the Hundred Foot Journey probably just like two days ago. Okay, I think it sounds like I saw it. What? Who's in it? Love it. it it's uh, I, be I believe it's Helen Mirren, um, who plays this, like this French. She runs this French restaurant that is her life. She's got like a Michelin star and all this kind of crap. And then you've got this Indian family that through some weird circumstances end up moving into their town and decide to open up a restaurant. Hmm. Right across the road from her restaurant, introducing Indian cuisine to this traditional, you know, French village, and it looks really—I'm going to use a really strange sounding word—delightful. It hmm. looks delightful. Wow. I think it looks great, and I can't wait to see it. And I've got a soft spot for food movies, like whether what was that one with Catherine Zeta Jones a couple of years ago? Catherine Zeta Jones and uh, Two Face, uh, 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 Eckhart. Eric Hart. Um, what's Eckhart's first name? Aaron. Aaron, Aaron Eckhart, Eckhart. Right. So that one with Aaron Eckhart and uh, Catherine Zeta Jones. I even thought that was kind of cute. There's a new movie out right now with John Favreau, which is really good, called Chef. My all-time favorite food movie is Ratatouille. Uh, and then there was that one called, uh, was it called Julia and Julia? The one with a ah. uh, Amy Adams um, trying to recreate the the, uh, the recipes of Julia Child. I got, I got. Meryl say, Streep is in it. I got to say, Child. I'm, I'm the food movies I like are called delicatessen. Like I'm like twisted. Like I want <laughs> dark, weird, twisted food movies. I'm, like uh, I watch Gordon Ramsay for fun. I mean, like the Kitchen yeah. Nightmare stuff. But yeah, Do you the, know I was on an episode of Kitchen Nightmares. No way. Yeah, Ann and I are in an episode of Kitchen Nightmares with the twin brothers. The, there's an episode of these twin brothers who are just buffoons. What is the episode? Because I'm watching that tonight uh, on it, Hulu yeah, Plus. I'm trying to remember the name. I think it's called the Michis. Anyway, and it was in uh, it was in Glendale or Eagle Rock. It was in Eagle Rock, and Ann knows some people at the Food Network because she's done a lot of right. food stuff. And we actually went, and you see us on, they, they actually quote us a couple times awesome. in the show, and they have it, and it was great. But anyway, that that doesn't answer your question at all. But this so. is about food, so it's partially answered. Yes, it is um, partially answered. So Helen Mirren, I love her. I, I haven't seen the trailer, but that sounds like a, a fun film. Yeah, you know? I, uh, yeah. so it's called The 100-Foot Journey. Um, go on YouTube, look for the trailer for it. It's really quite delightful. I, so those are some of my favorite food movies. But once again, my favorite is still Ratatouille. <laughs> All right, we go to question number five now. And question number five comes to us from Joe Mead, who writes, uh, You truly are the best damn movie news show on the internet. Thanks so much, Joe. Been watching since the beginning. My question is, if you've heard anything about a Bret Hart biopic based on his book and his documentaries, he was my hero growing up, and I believe his story would make a great movie. Also, would you want this to happen? Um, yeah, for any of you who know the story, I mean, this is going for us kids who grew up watching WWF, which is what it was called at the time. Now it's called WWE. And... I mean, when I was younger, I watched a lot of WWF. Man, I watched I watched through that whole Attitude Era, you know, with with Stone Cold and and The Rock and you know the uh, the the corporation and yeah, right up until about Evolution really got going and all that kind of stuff. So I was really into wrestling for a very long time. And my hero in wrestling, partially because he was Canadian, was Bret the Hitman Hart. Besser is, Besser was, Besser's ever going to be. Um, and that was him. Now the story of Bret Hart is fascinating like fascinating growing up in the dungeon in, in uh by calgary alberta and just the family lineage that he has in wrestling the death of his younger brother in a wrestling match that actually happened and then up for those of you who don't know the story of brett the hitman hart one of the most infamous thing that happens to brett hart right is he was at the just at the apex of his popularity and contract negotiations between him and the WWF had broken down. And he was now going to jump ship 
to the rival. The WWE had a rival for a while called WCW, and he right. was going to jump ship over the WCW. And they had one last match scheduled for him. And it was at, I think it might have been a SummerSlam or something like that. I can't remember the name of the event. But he was going to wrestle and defend the title because Bret Hart was the heavyweight champion at the time. And he was going to defend the title against Shawn Michaels, who was his big rival. And he had worked it out with Vince McMahon, the owner of WWE, that he was going to win the match and then retire the belt and move over to WCW. That's what he was going to do. However... Vince McMahon had other ideas. This is all true. This is all real life, true story stuff. So they're there. They have this like big, long wrestling match, this classic wrestling match between Bret Hart and Shawn Michaels. And then Shawn Michaels puts this move on Bret Hart that Bret Hart knew was coming. And then that's, he's going to get out of it and they're going to keep wrestling. But when he puts him in the hold, the referee calls for the bell and says, Bret submitted. And Bret Hart did not submit. <laughs> so it's like in front of this, I think it was in Montreal, Canada that it happened. In front of this hockey arena filled with tens of thousands of fans, Bret Hart loses the heavyweight title when he was not supposed to lose. But Vince McMahon had secretly arranged with Shawn Michaels, you're going to beat him, but Bret doesn't know you're beating him. And Bret Hart in the mm -hmm. ring, people didn't know if it was an act or not at the time, but it wasn't. Bret Hart got up, he spit on Vince, Vince oh. McMahon, he wouldn't leave the ring, he was angry, and it created this huge rift uh, that they have made documentaries about. I think the thing is called Wrestling with Shadows. Um, it's insane, and then he moves over, and then the story just continues between Vince McMahon and Bret Hart, and it's just this infamous quote, because Vince McMahon was interviewed about it, and Vince McMahon goes, I didn't screw Bret. Brett screw Brett. That's and became an wow. infamous line. Um, and I mean, they both kind of acted like jackasses, to be honest. But it's a look. If, even if you're not a wrestling fan, which most people aren't, it's a fascinating true life story. Um, just, just goes on top of I mean, the death of his younger brother Owen Hart in a wrestling ring. I mean, just, wow! Just so that happened after he left. After all the events between him and Vince McMahon, his brother was still in the WWE, and he died in a match because of a, of a malfunction and things like that. Just, the story is incredible. Yes, to answer your question, <laughs> I know I've gone off on a rant. I want to see that movie. I would love I'd see that to film. see a biopic <laughs> that, that really, on the life of Bret Hart, but that really focuses on that um, that's that split between him and the WWF at the time. Uh, it'd just be incredible. Do you know much about wrestling? Do you ever follow as a kid? Guys, I got nothing. I, <laughs> all I got is Willy Wonka's another food movie that I like. <laughs> <laughs> the Incredible Gobstopper. Yeah, I got nothing with the wrestling thing. Sorry. By the way, just as a... I don't really watch wrestling anymore. Like, I'll watch uh, WrestleMania now every year with, with some friends or whatever. Right. But I, I accidentally stumbled across about a month or two ago... I, because a friend recommended I listen to it, and I was on a long drive to Vegas, so I thought, oh, I'll just pop this in. Stone Cold Steve Austin has a podcast. Right. And it is one of the funniest things I've ever listened to. Nice. So if you just like if you like looking around for funny podcasts, check out Stone Cold Steve Austin. Just search yeah. for Steve Austin's you know podcast. You'll you find know what's it. really fun about the whole the wrestling uh, personas and the characters? There's so many things have spun out. We've got The Rock. Oh, from yeah. wrestling, oh, and it's yeah. like a, a Rowdy Roddy Piper from They Live, and like just mm -hmm. these these characters and personalities, and really fun. Well, Hulk Hogan, yeah, Hulk All the Hogan. Stuff he's done. So those are the things. I mean, for me, like you know, I watched wrestling when I was a lot younger, but never really got into the whole wrestling thing. So, but I've always been a fan of like seeing these wrestlers uh, come out of the wrestling ring and become a personality in films. I yeah. think it's a great it's a great stomping ground. Well, you we've know? got a new Leprechaun movie coming out with Hornswoggle <laughs> from <laughs> the WWE, right? Who's now going to be playing the Leprechaun? Leprechaun made famous by um, Wicked, uh, yes, by, by uh, Warwick, Davis, Warwick Davis. By Warwick Davis. So that's all happening too. All right, sorry, we went off on. I'm, I'm just ranting a lot today. I'm sorry, guys. All right, let's go to our last question. Bring up today. wrestling. That's John's <laughs> secret rant machine. <laughs> the last question today comes to us from Holly, and Holly writes, "I had a question regarding movie review embargoes." The Fault in Our Stars um, has been giving advanced screenings to critics and fans the last couple of weeks, so I went online figuring I could read a few reviews, only to discover that reviews have been embargoed until the day of the, mo of the movie's release. I know plenty of movies place embargo dates on reviews, but still allow reviews to be released a couple of weeks ahead of when the movie comes out to generate buzz. 
So my question is, if a studio decides to embargo reviews until just a few days before slash or the day of the movie's release, is that an indicator of the movie's quality? I.e., does that mean that the studio thinks the movie isn't going to be well received and wants to minimize the damage done by negative reviews coming out too early? Well, Holly, um, one of the things that I've said for a, a long time, if you really, and it, thankfully it does not happen often, what I've often said is, if there is a movie coming out, a wide release movie coming out that does not do press screenings, and ha this hardly ever happens. I can think of one or two a year that this happens with. But if there's a major wide release film coming out that does not even have press screenings, that's your red flag. That is your flag showing that that the studios have no confidence in this movie. They know people are going to dislike it. They know the critics right. are going to hate it. Therefore, let's not even show it to them. And to me, it's dirty pool. Yeah. To me, it's dirty pool. I, I believe they owe it to the public to show these films to the critics so the critics can give their impressions of the film so that the, the audience that's going to buy tickets have more than just your trailers to go on uh, about whether they see it. They can hear different points of view. And so when a studio does not show it, like I said, it hardly ever happens. But when they don't, that's a warning sign. As far as the review embargoes go, a lot of studios will say there's a review embargo. Like when you first go to see a press screening, they'll say, okay, there's a review embargo until the day of release. But inevitably what happens is almost every time, then like a week before the movie comes out, they send out an email that says, okay, the, the embargo has been lifted. So they just want to keep it. Now, um, they don't want reviews coming out a couple of weeks in advance. And the reason is this, for the most part, they want the reviews coming out about a week ahead of time or just a few days before the movie comes out. And that's when they'll lift the embargo because they're very strategic about planning out when to ramp up the buzz. Because they're afraid if, if you write your review for this movie three weeks in advance, people will have forgotten about your review when the movie even comes out. So they like to time the buzz to make sure like a hundred reviews come out on the same day, like four days before the movie opens to really have that peak of buzz right as the film's opening. So a lot of times that's the case. Very, very rarely will you actually see a studio actually keep their review embargo until actually the actual day of release. I mean, they'll often say that's the embargo, but then they lift it. Very rarely will they keep it till then. But yeah, I'm going to say if a studio doesn't lift their review embargo and says, okay, you can't actually put out the review until Friday night, the, the same day that the movie comes out, yeah, that should be a little bit of a red flag. It's going to be a stinker. Yeah, yeah, but Fault in Our Stars, I know they do not have an embargo until a day of release. I know Fault in Our Stars does not have that. So, uh, yeah, have you ever had any experiences with that? Uh, no, not really. Not in television. I mean, uh, for movies, it's like, uh, you know, as a movie goer, if I, if I saw that no reviews have been allowed for, you know, Ghost Rider. You know, so you're like, I saw the trailers. They're not letting anyone talk about it until the movie's out. Uh -uh. It just, it just, red flag. Yeah, it's a red flag. You'll see that happen with quite a lot of movies. A lot of low budget movies sometimes also do that, where the studio might not have uh, confidence in the film, but the film is actually good. Right. But they're just, they, for whatever reason, the studio's like, no, no, we don't want any, whether or not it's good press or bad press, just release it. So sometimes horror films get the, you know, bad end of the stick with that. But sometimes it's really because the film is not that good, you know, and they're just, we don't want anyone to just, you know, let's get that money from the first weekend and just let, let the thing die, you yeah, know. Yeah. It's one of those things, so. Well, all right, folks, that'll do it for us. We've gone through all of our questions today. Thank you so much for joining us for this Sunday edition of AMC Mailbag. Listen, don't forget, lots of great films playing in AMC theaters right now that have no review embargoes on them, <laughs> including <laughs> Million Dollar Arm. Trust me, guys, this is a really nice little film. If you have a chance, if you've already seen Godzilla and you've gotten your blockbusters out of the way, Go check out Million Dollar Arm. I highly recommend it. Uh, and, of course, Godzilla is playing in theaters right now. You, Neighbors is still playing. Lots of great theaters, uh, or lots of great movies, I should say, playing in AMC theaters everywhere right now. So do yourself a favor. Head on over to www.amctheaters.com for your theater, showtime, and movie ticket information. If you want an audio-only version of this show, head look on down in the description of this video, and you'll find links to our Stitcher and our iTunes. And don't forget to give us a thumbs up on the video and click subscribe. Become a subscriber to our show. And spread Spread the word. Share this episode. Share any episode of AMC Movie News and AMC Movie Talk or Mailbag, Jedi Council, whatever, on your Twitter, on your Facebook. Just help get the word out about what we're doing here. I want to thank, of course, the guy sitting with me, the one and the only Mr. John Schnepp. Schnepp, where can people find you online? You guys can find me at Twitter and Instagram, just at John Schnepp. 
And if you want to support my uh, Death of Superman Lives documentary, uh, just go to schnepzone.com slash Superman Lives and you can donate to become a finishing funder, get your name in the final credits of the film and help me push forward. I'm still working on getting a ton of amazing interviews and uh, I'm always posting stuff online that you read about. So thanks again. And uh, we were actually just talking, I'm going to give you a little bit of inside stuff here. This is the first time we're saying this publicly. If you're going to be at Comic-Con in San Diego, we're going to be there, and we're going to do a couple of things at, at, at Comic-Con that we're very excited about, and we'll, we'll let you know some more details in the coming weeks. But uh, we're not 100% sure of the date or time yet, but if you're going to be at Comic-Con, we are going to be at a booth at Comic-Con uh, signing with me, Schnepp, and the AMC crew uh, doing an autograph signing session. Yeah. Uh, so if you're going to be there, make sure you come and join us and uh, come by and find us and say hi. We'd love to meet you. So, uh, yeah, anyway, folks, that'll do it for us for this installment of AMC Mailbag. Thanks so much for joining us. My name is John Camp. You can find me on all the various social media channels, uh, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, whatever. Find me there. I'll keep you up to date, too, on, on all the stuff that's going on with us. So thanks a lot for joining us. And until next time, bye-bye.